in the chat. And now I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Chanda. Thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? You can see a slide and you can hear me? Great. Um, so I, I'm just gonna start with a, a couple of housekeeping things. So um, I definitely would prefer that um, we do questions at the end. I also wanna say, um, you know, it's a pandemic, we're doing things virtually. If I glitch out or something happens with, with my sound or something like that, and you really just missed something, I'm happy um, to be uh, interrupted to just say like, look, can you just repeat that one word or something like that? Um, or you can save the question till the end. I, the other thing I wanna say about questions as you're thinking about questions to pose, um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. So there are questions that are easy for me to answer, questions that are hard for me to answer, and questions that I don't know the answer to, in which case I will either very smoothly BS you, or I will just be honest with you and tell you that I don't know the answer to the question. Um, and of course, there is such a thing as a rude question. So I just want people to, to, to think about it uh, before, before you ask. Um, so I'm going to be talking tonight about some of the ideas and themes that are in my book. So let me start by going to the next slide. So I, a little bit about me that goes beyond uh, the introduction that you just heard. So I'm mostly a dark matter theorist. And by the end of this talk, you will have some understanding of what that means. And I'm also a bit of a neutron star observer, so I'm not really going to talk about neutron stars. I am currently really thinking about how I can work neutron stars more into my next book. Um, I actually submitted a proposal to NASA today um, to finance some of my neutron star research, so everybody wish me luck. Um, I also do work in Black feminist science, technology, and society studies. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but it's actually um, very influential in how I wrote my book. And so I will just mention that that's, that's, work, that's a field I'm actively working in. And so I'm actually an expert in two different disciplines. So I do have um, this book out, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred. Um, so one, I want to say, Support your local library. I think it's 100% awesome if you take books out of the library. And I think that sometimes people can think that um, it doesn't support authors if you do that, but actually making sure that your local library has a copy of our book ensures that our books remain in circulation and that the book is um, potentially discoverable by a random person who maybe can't afford a bookstore but spends a lot of time in the library. Um, so I'm a big fan of libraries. Uh, if you want your own copy, you can get signed copies from Water Street Books in Exeter, New Hampshire, um, where you, which is, I love it. Um, I, I, tr I almost tried to buy a house in Exeter just so I could be near that, <laughs> that bookstore. Um, so support your local indie bookstore if you are going to buy a copy of the book. Um, they have free domestic shipping, so there's no reason to go to that place that ships it to you really quickly. Um, but with a lot less love than Water Street Books, we'll, we'll ship it to you. Um, okay, so I, let me start by uh, helping people understand, um, you know, what is, what is the overarching theme of the book? And then what the heck is a cosmologist? <laughs> Um, so you might not even know what cosmology is. So by the end of this talk, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of that. So really for me, the fundamental theme of the work that I do is that we all have a right to know and love the night sky. And um, I, for me, this is a really, I don't know, this can sound self-serving because like, I don't know, I do particle astrophysics. So of course I think the night sky is really cool and I want everybody else to think it's really cool. Um, but I hope to impart to you also um, that we all have a connection to it, even if we don't do math, even if we're not interested in, in astrophysics as, as, a, as a technical activity, um, that everyone has wondered about the universe and about where we come from and who we are as a species. And I think that that's all wrapped up in understanding the night sky, because in some sense, um, the answers to where we come from, we partly get them from observing the sky. And not just, I want to be clear that this isn't just like 
if you can literally see it with your eyes, but also that we spend a lot of time observing the sky in wavelengths that we can't perceive with our eyes. And um, so if you're a blind person or have low visibility, that doesn't mean that you're locked out of that conversation. It just means that you have a different relationship with it than people who are seeing. Um, so what does a cosmologist do? So hopefully uh, I have a crowd here for whom the Beauty and the Beast reference is not totally lost. I, I was a big fan of Beauty and the Beast when I was, when I was a kid. Um, essentially, cosmologists are the physicists slash astronomers who are tasked with filling in the cosmic timeline. So what you're looking at here is a kind of cartoon of the cosmic timeline. So it has on the left side of the diagram, you see this um, big bang. So if any of you read my new scientist column, you'll know that my last new scientist column kind of talked about how we don't really understand what happened at this point, but we're just going to refer to it as the Big Bang. And um, if people want to ask a question about that during the Q&A, we can talk about it more later. So you'll notice that part of the diagram on the left has like these rainbow colors inside of it. And then at some point, it becomes black. And so what's the difference? So the, the first part of the diagram that's filled with color is from whatever happened before the Big Bang to about 380,000 years. And during this time period, the universe is kind of filled with this highly energetic like particle stew. And what this means is that it's very dense. And so when something causes light to be emitted, light can't... Uh, get very far before it runs into something else and starts scattering. And so light can't travel in a straight line because it's constantly bouncing off of stuff. Um, and so this goes on for about 400,000 years. And um, in the meantime, the first particles start to form. Um, the first nuclear fusion happens. And then at some point, so this happens at about 380,000 years neutral hydrogen forms for the first time, and the universe becomes transparent to light for the very first time. So I want you to pay attention to where this yellow arrow is. This is the moment when light can start flowing freely through space time. And so that's why it's black on the other end, because it's transparent. It's no longer filled with plasma and light. So there are a few different things happening. First of all, this light is flowing freely through the universe. So, um, and obviously this is all like a cartoon image, right? But just kind of bear with me that my mouse waving up and down is light flowing freely through the universe. And you can kind of see this drawing on the top that the light is flowing freely through the universe. And at the same time, the universe space-time is expanding. And so the light's wavelength is getting stretched. And that means that the light is getting redder as time goes on, because as space time expands, the light is being stretched with it and is, is getting redder and redder. Um, so one of the things that you might have noticed while I was talking is that this diagram is not at all to scale, right? I have zero around here, 380,000 here, and then almost 14 billion years here. And somehow, protons form right here, and then we have galaxies on the other end. So my task as a cosmologist is to understand the details of this timeline and fill in the parts that we don't understand. And so I spend a lot of time trying to understand the relationship between this moment in time, the 380,000 years, which we call the cosmic microwave background radiation, and how information in this radiation tells us about how galaxies form and more broadly about what we call structure formation. So structure formation includes galaxies, stars, planets, people. We are structures that have formed in the universe. This is a really important thing is that there's in some sense like no distinction between us and, and the rest of the galaxy. Um, so part of what's really interesting about this, this moment, this cosmic microwave background radiation, is that we can actually still see it. 
So it's continuously getting stretched through time, but it's actually everywhere in the universe. Um, and so I know that we're all socialized to hear the word radiation and get really worried. Um, but this is, um, you know, a radiation that basically the entire universe has evolved with it in the background. So there's no threat to us because we have evolved with it being present in the universe with us the, the entire time. Um, you might also notice that the word microwave is in it. And that's because the wavelength that we now see it in is a microwave wa wavelength. So that's um, part of the radio spectrum. So it's not something we can see with our eyes. It's something that we see with radio telescopes and then we interpret into data um, on, on computers. So I made some comments about the expanding universe. So I wanna give you a little bit of intuition about what it means when we say that space-time is expanding. So if you imagine a balloon and it has magic yellow dots on it, and these dots are magic because when we blow up the balloon, the dots aren't going to expand, but rather the balloon is going to expand between the dots. So this is what is happening with space-time and with galaxies. So the galaxies are yellow, are like the yellow dots. And as space-time expands, the yellow dots become further away from each other because the space-time is expanding between the dots. I also mentioned that light is redshifting as space-time goes on, right? Um, and so that's kind of that's represented by these, these red squiggles, is as um, space-time expands, the light is also going to get stretched out. So that's what we mean when we talk about an expanding universe. You may hear other people use like race car analogies, like galaxies are flying away from each other, but what's happening is much more fantastical than galaxies flying away from each other, that actually space time is expanding between galaxies and causing them to be further away from each other. And so this is something that's continuously happening. And there are two things that we need to think about when we're thinking about what is the evolution of space time and what is the evolution of the stuff inside of it which is that what space-time contains is going to dominate how that expansion happens, how quickly it happens. So we need to not only understand how quickly space-time is expanding, but also what is the stuff inside of it and how does that shape how fast space-time is expanding. So part of a cosmologist's job is also to better understand what is the universe made of. Um, so I'm not going to talk today about dark energy, but it is the dominant form of matter energy content in the universe. And this is actually, I spent my, my PhD working on the dark energy problem. So I'll just say it's a really exciting problem. There is discussion about it in the book, including discussion about my PhD work, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so most of the matter in the universe is actually comprised of this matter energy. I should say matter energy is comprised of this dark energy and something that we call dark matter. And actually you'll see we have people um, under normal matter uh, and it's in quotes and it's only 5%. And that's because we are the cosmic weirdos. And I don't mean that's because there are definitely no aliens. I don't know, there might be life somewhere out there. I don't think we've had contact with it. But I'm, um, the majority of matter in the universe is not the stuff that we can see. And we are made of the stuff that we can see. And so, you know, I, I want people to understand that we are actually like a really unique and precious um, part of the universe because actually everything that you can see is highly unusual. And the universe is mostly made up of stuff that we can't see. Um, so what you're looking at here is that same cosmological timeline. You're all now kind of baby experts on the cosmological timeline. So here we have, again, the Big Bang. We have that um, about 400,000 year mark and we have the cosmic microwave background. So what you're looking at on the top here is real data from telescopes. So here you see um, cosmic microwave background image from the COBE Space Telescope. So this, uh, telescope, um, actually it was a NASA project. It, uh, its leaders won the Nobel Prize. And one of the reasons is that you might think that the, the radiation would all be about the same wavelength. 
And actually the cosmic microwave background radiation and really any um, form of light, you can associate a temperature with it. So we tend to talk about the, the CMB as we call it in terms of temperature. And it's about 2.73 degrees Kelvin. So it's really cold, very, very cold. And it's, and it's all pervasive. The reason that you're seeing variations in color here is that actually there are very small variations in temperature. And I say very small, I mean one part in 10 to the five. So if you think of a decimal with um, several zeros after it, that is how small the variations are. You might think, okay, well, first of all, why would those variations happen? But also like, why are they meaningful? So the variations we think happen because there are small quantum fluctuations in space-time in the very early universe. And those ca cause these little fluctuations in temperature. And they matter because they are the imprints of what will translate into structure formation. So here on the right, we're looking at the Hubble deep field. So this is taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is one of the deepest images ever taken of the universe. Pretty much every dot in this image is a galaxy. So you're looking at hundreds of billions of stars. This is a really exciting image. Um, I strongly encourage you to look it up when you're done with this talk today. In between, um, we also have data from the Spitzer Space Telescope. So I just want to mention that these are all NASA missions. Uh, and I, in the, in the greater context, by the way, of, of the, the federal budget, basically NASA does all of this on like a dime. Uh, NASA sent, gets these incredible images on what is relative to all of our federal spending, a shoestring budget. Um, so this Spitzer telescope looks in the infrared and allows us to see at about 400 million years and allows us to see first light. So another way of thinking about what the task before me as a cosmologist is, is figuring out how we get from the CMB to the Spitzer first light to the Hubble deep field. What is the mathematical story? How can I write down equations that tell a consistent cosmological tale of how we get from point A to point B? Um, and the important thing to understand is that here, we're just looking at stuff that we can see. But as I've just told you, stuff that we can see is actually a very small fraction of the matter energy content that is out there. And so this requires also using what we can see to try and understand the behavior of the stuff that we can't see. And so for example, understanding dark matter. And so we're often also trying to use these images to gather more information about that. So I showed you the COBE data of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and there were some different colors. And uh, as I said, they were associated with um, fluctuations in the temperature. And that project won the Nobel Prize because before COBE went up, we had actually never seen those temperature fluctuations before. They had been hypothesized in theory, but nobody had ever actually seen them. Um, so that's actually, that data is at this point about 20 years old. So the state of the art is from this Planck Space Telescope, uh, which was a European Space Agency led mission with NASA involvement. And as you can see, the, the level of detail that we're able to get to now is incredible. So this is the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this is an image of our entire sky in the wavelength where the CMB emits. This is a really, really hard image to take. So first of all, the telescope was sent to the second Lagrange point between the Earth and the sun, which is on the other side of the moon. So there's a whole drama of, of getting the instrument there and hoping nothing is broken, building it. But the other thing is, is as magnificent as our galaxy is, our galaxy actually gets in the way of observations. And so they actually have to carefully subtract out all of the things that are not the CMB so that they can actually construct this image. Um, I've also made a point of telling you that this is like microwave, like radio data. So you might wonder where the color comes from. 
And I, I encourage people to look this up, but actually a lot of the astronomy images that you see have color restored to them or color put in to help us visualize what's happening in, in the image. Um, but they don't just like roll off the, the telescope with all of the colors applied. There's actually like a lot of work that goes into making these um, accessible for, for humans to interact with. So again, what you're looking at here is little fluctuations in the temperature. And the way to think about this is if you take the orange spots and you think there's a little bit of extra stuff, it's a little bit warmer. And then you look at the blue spots and you think it's a little bit colder. This corresponds to, in the places where it's a little bit warmer, a little bit of extra stuff. In the places where it's colder, a little bit less stuff compared to the average. And this means that um, you have gravitational wells forming. And so in the places where there's a little bit of extra stuff, over time, more stuff is going to accumulate through gravitational pull. And this is how you start to form structures. So you're really looking here at the seeds of structure formation. So as I've mentioned, the, the job of the cosmologist is trying to figure out how we go from those little seeds of structure formation to the cosmological phenomena that we see in the galaxy in, in the universe today. So what you're looking at here is also real data. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. A lot of the people who were involved in SDSS are actually here in New England, particularly at the um, Smithsonian Astrophys Astrophysical Observatory and also the Harvard College Observatory um, in Cambridge. What you're looking at here is a cosmic web. So these are galaxies and galaxy clusters. And you can see that there are places where there is extra stuff. And then there's places where there's less stuff. And so you can see that there is some kind of mapping between the cosmic microwave background radiation and the, um, and the sky that we see today. So I've mentioned that a lot of this is going to be dominated by dark matter. And we don't actually know what dark matter is. So the gist of it is, is that stars and galaxies, if all the matter that was in a galaxy was the matter that radiates, so the luminous matter, the stuff that we can see, when we look at stellar orbits around the center of their galaxies, we would expect that the speed, which is the, the vertical axis here, against the distance from the center, that the, it would plot out a path that looks like the orange line. But actually, what we observe is the green line. And this was first realized by Vera Rubin in um, the late 60s. She took an instrument developed by astronomer Kent Ford, and the two of them went and looked at stars and realized that the stars were not at all moving like the orange line. They were moving like the green line. And that suggested that the stars were moving too fast for the amount of mass that we were measuring the galaxies to have. And that suggested that there was a bunch of mass, particularly a lot of matter further away from the center of the galaxy that we just couldn't see. So apparently we need more mass than we can see. And there are two ways to think about this problem. One way to think about this problem is um, you know, there's missing matter. Another way to think about it is maybe we're interpreting our data through the wrong theory of gravity. So I just want to mention that modified gravity continues to be an active field of research. It's much smaller. Um, it's harder to make the data that we have fit the modified gravity picture, but it's a possibility. Um, and so, you know, why is the dark matter? So we actually don't know. Um, and, and that's a good thing in some sense, because I have a day job I'm figuring out what it is. That's, that's part of what my responsibilities at the University of New Hampshire are, in addition um, to, to teaching and, and doing service to my university. Um, but we know, the first thing that we know about it is it doesn't really seem to produce light, right? Because if it did, we would be able to see it. And we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, I say it produces no light here, but it actually maybe produces a little bit, but it's so weak that we can't see it. So we have a tendency to talk about dark matter as if it's only interaction, the only force that has any effect on it is gravity. But it may be that it also has some interactions with the other forces we know about, and they're just so insignificant that we haven't been able to, to detect them yet. Now, here's the thing about the name. 
The name is a bit of a misnomer. So it's true that out here at the higher radius, the space time um, seems dark as in it's not lit up, right? But that's because the light that's, that's radiating off the galaxy is going right through the dark matter. So it should really be called invisible matter or transparent matter because light goes right through it. So if I had like a clump of dark matter in my hands, I could claim to you that I have a clump of dark matter in my hands right now. And you actually wouldn't know if I was lying because my hands would look the same whether I had a clump or not. You would be able to see light just going right through it. Um, so we have a couple of different ways of knowing that dark matter exists. So the first was those um, what we call rotation curves uh, from the, the Rubin and Ford work. Um, the second is that when you have a lot of dark matter, it causes space time to act like a funhouse mirror. And so what you're looking at here is real data. So this is taken with the Hubble telescope. The universe is an amazing place. If this image doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Um, what you're looking at is a real correct image. Nobody's made any mistakes. Nobody's mucked it up. Um, but actually there's stuff in here that's not physically out there in the universe. And what I mean by that is there are these, you see these beautiful galaxies, they're very bright. And then you also see these like arky kind of banana um, things that kind of surround it. So these are basically like funhouse mirror images that have been caused by space time being so bent by the presence of matter. Um, by of dark matter that it causes artifact duplicate images in the telescope. So the way that this works is we're here on Earth. The Hubble telescope is in low Earth orbit, so it's basically practically on Earth um, for cosmological distances. We're looking at some galaxy that's far away, and the galaxy is radiating light, so that's what these white lines are. And in between us and the galaxy, there is a galaxy cluster that has a lot of dark matter in it. Because there's so much dark matter, it is causing space time to bend. And so as the light tries to travel, it can only travel on space time. So light goes forward and it has to travel on space time. And that means it has to travel in this bent area. And this translates into um, these orange lines, these lensed galaxy images. And so we get these false images on our telescope that don't actually reflect where the galaxies are. They just look like they're there and they look really stretched out, but they're basically funhouse mirror reflections. So that's gravitational lensing. And it's very hard to explain, explain gravitational lensing like this without dark matter. It's very hard to do it with modified gravity. So that's one of the reasons that we think dark matter is out there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have this beautiful cosmic microwave background radiation. And you might think, oh, she's been spending a lot of time on that. Um, not only does this give us a picture of the universe when it was about 400,000 years old, but actually this is our most substantive evidence for the existence of dark matter at this point in time. So again, I've talked to you about how there are these little temperature fluctuations um, in, in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now I'm going to show you a little video um, that, that gives you some insight actually into how the data looks when um, we're actually talking about it among scientists. Um, so by the way, there are people at the European Space Agency and NASA who spend like a lot of time putting together stuff on their website for folks who are excited about space. So I encourage you to just hang out on their website. Um, whoop. Now it's going to have to start again. OK, so while it's starting again, the thing that I'm going to tell you about this video is that it's going to break out the little temperature fluctuations and tell us how much power is in those temperature fluctuations. So what you're seeing is the different length scales, like distance scales on the image, right? So remember, this is a map of the sky. And those correspond to different power levels, like how much fluctuation is there at different length scales. And so you can see, actually, that there isn't a ton of fluctuation on, large, on the large length scales. 
Um, but then when we get to this middle length scale at the top, there's really strong fluctuation. Um, and it just gets stronger and stronger until we get to this point, which is like the pinnacle, the most fluctuations. And this is really, um, this is I, 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 incredibly, I could just give you all a talk about the CMB. I didn't write my entire book about the CMB though, so I couldn't do that today. Um, but this is really just like a beautiful thing. Um, so this is called a power spectrum. This is why I was using the word power, because it just tells you how much fluctuation there was at, at different length scales. Um, and all of those images come together to make your CMB. So that's the connection between the image that we show to the public and then actually the way that we look at the data is that we actually spend a lot of time looking at what we call the power spectrum. Um, so what does that have to do with dark matter? So you're again looking at the power spectrum here. So these on the vertical axis, you have the temperature fluctuations. And on the horizontal axis, you have the angular distance on the sky. And you'll notice there's a red line, and then there are all these blue dots, and the blue dots have lines um, of varying sizes attached to them. So the red line is the predicted power spectrum from theory that was developed in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. So starting before the, the cosmic microwave background radiation had been detected, the blue dots are the actual data from the Planck telescope. Um, and as you can see, after you get away from the large scales where like our galaxy messes the data up a lot. So there are error bars on these dots um, at the largest scales. But once you get past this dotted line, you see that the blue dots match the predictions almost perfectly. This is one of the most beautiful fits that you will ever see between theoretical physics and observational cosmology. Um, the, the error bars are tiny, which means we, we have really high confidence in these data points, and they match the theory perfectly. Um, the only way that this data matches the theory perfectly is if we assume the existence of a dark matter component that takes up about 25% of the matter energy in the universe. So at the moment, this plot is our strongest evidence for the existence of dark matter. Um, okay, so I've been showing you some tactical stuff. Let's step back and like, okay, I've, I've said some things about how there's a lot of dark matter. Where is it? geographically. So here's a little bit of a map. So we think we have our luminous galaxy, like let's say um, the Milky Way. And we think that every single galaxy lives in a halo of dark matter that actually extends well beyond the luminous part of the galaxy. And that some galaxies like the Milky Way will also have satellite galaxies. And those satellite galaxies will live in their own little um, sub halos. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you kind of a schematic of this. So this is an actual map. This is the Milky Way. This is our nearest major neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy M31. Google images of it. It's a beautiful galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, you'll see that each of them has some galaxies around them. So actually, the Milky Way has over 60 satellite galaxies. Um, so you'll sometimes hear these called dwarf galaxies, but actually like the Milky Way is not just home uh, to stars and planets and at least 7 billion um, human uh, ape-like forms, right? Um, but actually it's home to uh, a lot of other galaxies. So inside the Milky Way dark matter halo, there are also um, satellite galaxies in their own subhalos. So that's where the dark matter is. Um, so what do we know about dark matter so far? So we know that photons, like light, doesn't interact with it much. We know the particles are relatively slow moving, so they're not relativistic. And we know they're not short lived. And those two things basically mean that they have the right properties to be available to take the time to build a galaxy. So you can just use common sense. If it's short lived, it blips out of existence. How do you make the galaxy? It's like trying to build a um, a house and the cement foundation just keeps evaporating. You can't actually build a house like that. 
Um, when we put these properties into computational work, it reproduces stuff that looks like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So you get that cosmic web, you get the hierarchical structure formation. So simulations and data match when we assume these properties. Um, but still, I, I can't tell you like what kind of particle is it. Um, so this is the problem that we have today, which is there's a particle physics problem. We know it's not any of the particles we've ever seen before. And that means it's beyond standard model physics. Um, and that's a, that's a major focus of my work right now. Um, it's great for theoretical physicists because that means that over the years, people have come up with a lot of different ideas. So what you're looking at is the greatest Venn diagram of all time. So yes, this is a Venn diagram. Um, these are all different theories of dark matter that theoretical physicists have had over the years and their overlap with each other. So they might have some properties in common, even if they're distinct. I genuinely wish I could take credit for this Venn diagram, but it was created by my, my friend, um, Tim Tate, who's the chair of the physics department at the University of California at Irvine. Um, this is a figure that appears in my book. So if you felt like, oh my God, she just gave us a lot of information. I wanna read it more slowly on my own time. This is all stuff that's discussed in my book. Um, you'll notice that there's one thing that's maybe not like the others on here, which is that primordial black holes have recently become kind of a popular uh, dark matter candidate. And I'm not gonna say anything more about that here, but there's some discussion about that in the book. And I'm, I'll just give you a teaser. I'm not gonna spend time on this today, but I spend a lot of my time in the axion like particle corner of this Venn diagram. Uh, so I am actually in some places known as the axion wrangler, um, I, but the science journalist Ryan Mandelbaum gave me that name at some point and I liked it, so I kept it. So this is a preview of some of the things that um, you'll learn about if you pick up the book. Um, and the last thing that I, I, I want to mention just about uh, dark matter and, and trying to understand what dark matter is, is there are different ways that we can look for dark matter. So we can look for dark matter's interaction with different parts of the standard model. So um, quarks and gluons or leptons and electrons. You've probably heard of an electron at least, right? Um, or um, the photons or any of uh, those types of particles. And those kinds of experiments are usually called direct detection, indirect detection, or particle collider. And so basically, they're dark matter that somehow interacts with standard model particles, so normal everyday stuff. So maybe the interaction isn't just through gravity, but also through the weak force and the strong force and the electromagnetic force. And we just need to go out and look for it using experiments <laughs> here on Earth. I'm, my specialty is primarily in astrophysical probes, which is using um, the universe as a natural laboratory to better understand what the dark matter is and how dark matter is interacting with itself. So actually one of the roles, I don't write about this in the book, um, is I am a topical convener for what is called the snow mass process. So about every 10 years, the particle physics community gets together and writes a book. Um, that we then give to people at, the, at um, the, the White House Office of Science and Technology about what we think the most exciting science over the next 10 years can be. Like, what do we think we're able to do? What do we think the problems should be? And what direction do we think the field should go in? And so I'm one of three people who's responsible um, for making the case for cosmic probes of dark matter. So I'm, I'm, this is really where my heart is. I was actually just a couple of hours ago in a snow mass at Cosmic Probes of Dark Matter meeting. So this is like, you're literally hearing about like, this is my life as a scientist. Um, so when we talk about what are astrophysical probes of dark matter, um, one of the projects that I'm most excited about that's, that's coming online in the next couple of years is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. So you might recognize that name because Vera Rubin was the woman who first found the most substantive evidence for dark matter with those rotation curves. Um, and uh, today she has this observatory named after her. 
Um, she was also, I, as I write about in the book, she was, um, and I had a really influential meeting with her once at a women in astronomy conference that kind of changed the way I thought about myself as a scientist. So I'm a proud member of the Vera Rubin Observatory Collaboration, and this observatory is being built in the Chilean desert pretty much as I speak, and we'll start getting data from it in about two years. And I think it's going to change the way that we see the universe. So that's pretty exciting to not just be like, yeah, it's going to change the way we see the world. No, it's going to change the way we see the whole universe. Um, I am not just a ground-based person. And even though I'm primarily a theoretical physicist, so I do a lot of math, I, as you can see, I do some dabbling with observational astronomy as well. Um, I also do X-ray astronomy. And I just want to point out to you that like I have been like a person this entire time right like I think that there can be sometimes like these stories or narratives about scientists like we're machines and not really people. So I like showing people this slide, which is me at various stages of my career as a as a student um, through right through being a postdoctoral fellow before I became a professor here at the University of New Hampshire. So this photo from 1999, I'm pretty sure is the first selfie I ever took. I took it on a film camera. Um, this is me as, as a, a, a freshman at Harvard College in my, in my dorm room. Um, a few of these pictures, so the one from 2006 that was taken while I was in graduate school, um, and also the one in 2011, I was still in graduate school. No, I had just finished my PhD at this point. These were both taken at the National Society of Black Physicists. And as you can see, I was giving talks and doing really serious science. And I was also having fun with my friends. Um, in, in 2011, I returned to Cambridge as a postdoctoral fellow at MIT and um, bought my first home. And so actually this photo from 2012 was at my housewarming party, which also doubled as my 30th birthday party. Um, and my, my then, I guess this was before my 30th birthday, so we hadn't gotten engaged yet. So my then boyfriend, now husband, um, took this photo of me. And um, here is a photo of me at Burbeck College at the University of London in 2017 as a postdoc giving a lecture on feminist theory. Um, so there's a human side to, to the doing of science and, and to this intellectual work that we do. And I like to bring myself into the story partly because the way that I think about the doing of physics is, is very much shaped by the experience that I've had as, um, as, a, as an undergraduate, as a graduate student, as a, as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and it's easy to articulate people like me, people of color, um, Black women, as I'm you know, new to science. And so I like to remind people that actually, even though I am a barrier breaker in my subfield. Um, a Black woman's never held a faculty position in theoretical cosmology before. I'm the first. Um, that I am actually from a long line of Black thinkers um, and doers and makers um, that go back to the continent of Africa. And that when we really think about what it took to run a plantation, that this was intellectual expertise. I also like to point people to Elmer Imes, who almost never comes up in stories uh, about the history of quantum mechanics. But um, he was the second African American to earn a PhD in physics. And he provided with his PhD work um, the first experimental evidence that really got people thinking, oh, there is something to this quantum mechanics thing. He also went on to found the physics department at the historically Black university, Fisk University. And so many Black physicists have gone through that department that it's actually pretty hard to find one of us who hasn't been mentored by someone who was trained in that department um, or who hasn't in some way been touched by the reach of, of that department. So if you haven't heard of Fisk, um, I'll just say historically Black colleges and universities in general punch way above their pay grade. And like I talk about NASA doing things on a shoestring budget. This is like a real shoestring, shoestring budget. Um, so I just want to cap off, my book is a holistic look at the doing of physics. And this means also talking about how physics is done and the problems with how physics is done. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a, a few slides before I wrap up where I'm going to talk about, um, and, and this is the beginning of a talk that I often give to other physicists. Um, we talk a lot these days about diversity and inclusion. And um, 
I don't know what's up with y'all in Maine, but here in New Hampshire, we are having some drama about whether freedom of speech is allowed or not regarding diversity and inclusion, um, because apparently some people don't believe in the First Amendment anymore. Um, so I want to talk to people what, about what I think the problem with, the, with diversity and inclusion is. And it's not that people are saying the words out loud, <laughs> although I know some people feel that way about it. Um, the question I want people to ask themselves is when we talk about diversity and inclusion, what will it do for Breonna Taylor? So that might seem like a really weird question to ask um, because she's dead and she was killed by police in, in Kentucky. Um, and, that, and that's sort of the point is that talking about diversity and inclusion doesn't ensure that what happened to her will never happen again. And you might say, okay, but what does that have to do with doing physics? Um, it has everything to do with doing physics because first of all, you don't know if the person who was killed would have gone on to do great physics. You don't know if they would have parented a great physicist, um, but it is also the context in which black physicists have to do physics, which is worrying about something like this happening to them. So I want people to really think about what is the root problem and what can I do about it and go beyond diversity and inclusion in, in having that conversation. Um, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we tend to talk about it in terms of statistics. So I wanna show you all some data. So this is the number of African-American and Hispanic women with bachelor's degrees in astronomy, the classes of 1997 through 2016. So you can see the data is aggregated. You can see between 2002, 2006, there were about um, like 11 or 12 black women who earned bachelor's degrees in astronomy. So in 2003, I was the only one. Um, I, I, I also want to point out one of the problems with this data is that when you separate Hispanic and African American, you treat them like two separate groups, but there are a lot of Afro Latino people out there who fall into both categories. Um, and also Hispanic is not a racial identity, right? So some of the people in that category are also white. Um, so you can see that the numbers are very low. Um, I, and I just want to, you know, give people like a real sense of like what the, the numerical disparities are. So as you can see, there are about 2000 PhDs granted in physics in the United States every single year. Um, and about 20 of them or fewer each year go to someone who's African American and it's almost always men. So out of those 2000 PhDs per year in the I guess we're now at the, the 40, 50 year point. In the 50 years since the first African American woman earned a PhD in physics, Willie Hobbs Moore, there have been under 100 Black women to earn a PhD from a department of physics. So 100 over 50 years versus 2,000 every year. So when you hear people talking about like disparities and numbers and representation, this is what we're shouting about. I think like I just want, I want that to be very clear for people. But also people sometimes have misunderstandings um, about if you just talk about the numbers and you don't talk about the social context that shapes why the numbers look the way they do, you're not really tackling the problem. Um, so I just want to remind people that social phenomena shape science, not because the law of gravity is different if you're Black or if you're white or if you're from Mexico or if you're from Canada, um, but because universality and objectivity are different. The laws of physics are true everywhere in the universe. That's universality. Um, objectivity means you have an unbiased perspective, but we're all shaped by the perspective around us. Um, so I just want to I want to help people understand that nobody's attacking science when they say that social phenomena shape science. What they're doing is actually fighting to make science as a community and as a community of practice a better place that can actually do a better job at understanding the laws of physics and ultimately um, humans treating each other like humans. Um, and that means actually digging into the history of what science has been and how it has been to people. So I just want to remind folks that J. Marion Sims, considered the father of modern gynecology, for example, um, experimented on, on, on enslaved Black women. He didn't believe that Black women felt pain, so he did not anesthetize them. And he would just cut them open and look at their uteri and, and explore. And I'm um, 
this is something that black women have known. It's a story that was spread and it shapes, for example, people's feeling of trust when they go to the doctor's office. So when we're having these conversations about people being anxious about, for example, getting vaccines, it has to be read in context of what the historical relationship of medicine has been with communities. Even though we know actually that a major reason there are, for example, COVID-19 vaccine disparities is because um, there are more difficulties with accessing the vaccine in certain communities, particularly if, and this is something you all may be sympathetic to from your own experience, you don't have time to feel sick for one to two days after you get the shot, right? Um, so this is one of the reasons why, for example, we need um, better, better health care um, and better sick day um, relief at the federal level so that people can actually go and get the shot. Um, what I'm showing you here is Kanaka Meoli. So these are Native Hawaiian women who are protesting the building of a telescope on what is considered to be unceded Native Hawaiian land on the Mauna Kea um, volcano slash mountaintop in Hawaii. Um, and often I've been very involved in the, the debate about the 30 meter telescope, this new telescope. And I talk about this a lot in the book. I obviously am running low on time, so I don't have a lot of time to talk about this here. Um, but one of the things that I want to say is that the women in this photo are often framed as anti-science. And as someone who spent a lot of time talking to the Mauna Kea protectors, I um, have to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. They're incredibly curious. They ask me questions about science all the time. Um, and they have helped me better understand how I as a scientist can make my science better serve humanity um, and how it fits into the, the cosmological story. Um, so what, is it, what does the night sky mean to us? We as a species evolved under the night sky and we are a storytelling species. The night sky figures into our storytelling. Um, so as uh, Juan Luis Arzuaga um, proposes, the human is not only a languaging being, but a storytelling species. Um, and as Sylvia Winter has called it, um, we are homo nerens. Um, so we are a hybrid species. We are both biological, but we are also social. And that means to be cut off from the night sky is to be cut off from our humanity. So having access to a dark night sky is really important and making sure that everybody has access to a dark night sky is really important. So I want people to ask themselves the question, what changes would we need to make to our society in order for everyone to have access to a dark night sky? Um, and you know, before we get to the answer to that question, I want people to look at this image. So this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a small version of it. You can actually zoom in really deep on this picture. Um, I had to use the small version because the big version is 75 megabytes, and I wanted to make sure that the streaming still worked. Um, this is what we're talking about, being able to see this and be in awe of it and experience the awe of it. Um, but being able to access a, a, a dark night sky means that people need to not be hungry. They need to have housing security so that they're well rested. They need clean water so they're not feeling sick. Um, they need to have a sense of sovereignty over their indigenous communities. We need clear skies. We need, um, you know, if you're someone who uses a wheelchair for mobility, we need wheelchairs that can get us to the places where we need to go. Um, and we need colonialism as we understand it to, to come to an end. And this is what can bring us into um, this a, a better future where we are in better relations with each other. So this is the story that I tell in my book. Um, so we're just beginning. This is the end of the talk. I ran a little bit on the long side because I, I wanted to include some of this stuff. And I just want to say, if you remember nothing else, cosmological storytelling like liberation struggle is a fundamental human activity. And so here what I'm showing you is um, a Haitian protester who was asking the president to step down. And I just want to remind everyone that there are people who are fighting for their freedom in Haiti right now and have been for a long time. Um, and we should do our best to learn about their struggle, um, including why um, they're still in debt to France over slavery, basically, because they liberate the, liberated themselves from slavery. So that when the story is told in the press that they are the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, the reason is because France took all of their money. Um, so 
you might see that as political propaganda, and I would just say that's empirical evidence. Um, and so let's be scientists about it. So thanks everyone for coming, and I'm happy to answer all of your curious questions about dark matter in, in the few minutes that we have. If you have a question, um, you can ask it in the chat if you prefer, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself. It's totally up to I you. I did look at the chat. Um, Robin, do you want to ask your question out loud or I can just read it? Uh, well, I'm curious about, you said about going to find dark matter and I wondered why wouldn't there be some in the solar system right here? So people actually do, um, we, we have a sense that there is an average dark matter density. And in fact, there may be dark matter going right through you right now. <laughs> that, um, that, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's definitely a, a possibility. And, and in some sense, the way you can think about that is it constrains what forms it can take, right? So if um, it was like asteroid size, then we would feel it. Um, and so that that actually can even give you, even as if you're not a scientist, some intuition for, um, you know, what dark matter can't be. This is a great well, question. Thanks for asking that. Does it have to be a size or can it be a particle like a neutrino that we wouldn't know? So neutrinos do you have an extent associated with them. Um, and, you know, actually, when I graduated from high school, I... Uh, people thought that neutrinos maybe were the dark matter. And it's only really in the last few years that people have realized that it's that neutrinos are not massive enough to, to comprise the dark matter. But it, it does have at least some similarities with neutrinos and that like neutrinos also go right through us, right? Like we have a lot of neutrinos flying through us every second. Yeah, the, I'm curious about the question about how to discern one from the other. Yeah, so let me... There is, oh, this always happens when I try and back up too quickly. <laughs> so let me try it again. Um, I have like one particular slide I wanna go to. Um, I appreciate this line of questioning, by the way. So, uh, okay. So I went through this slide kind of quickly, mm -hmm. but this is, I think that this is the, the, key, the key image to look at, um, which is that, we can look for dark matter by building experiments like here on earth where we hope that the dark matter will interact somehow with matter that we have seen before um, and matter that we know about and so that's what these um, direct detection experiments are um, we can also hope that when dark matter interacts with itself it will produce particles that we are familiar with so that's mm -hmm. these indirect detections. You can see the DM stands for dark matter and SM stands for standard model. So that's like normal matter. So direct detection is you have dark matter interact with standard model and you get dark matter and standard model out. Indirect detection is you have dark matter interacting with itself and it causes like, for example, photons. So you see some light. Um, particle colliders are, um, you know, we, we have a very famous one in Switzerland and France, and also Fermilab used to be famous for being a particle collider, where you would smash two standard model particles together, and you do it at such a high energy that maybe it produces some dark matter. And so these are all, all three of these are different ways that we can actually look for dark matter directly. Um, there are some astrophysical probes that should also fall in this category. So for example, you can use neutron stars as kind of natural laboratories in space. And that's one of the reasons that I do work on neutron stars. Um, and also there is a raging, 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 raging debate right now. Um, we have seen a lot of extra gamma rays at the center of the galaxy. And there's like a big, like literal, like almost knockdown drag out fight happening over whether it is a bunch of neutron stars at the center of the galaxy or it's the first evidence for dark matter. And when I characterize this, just because you know, I also do sociology of science, I'll give you a little bit of a feel for it. I'm talking about like people going and yelling at each other in the middle of talks because they disagree about it. I personally think this is really unprofessional. And also I like to remind people like nobody's gonna die if like your, your idea is wrong. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> so I don't think it's the sort of thing that people should be yelling at each other about. Um, but I also understand feeling passionate about this work. Um, and it's just a matter of like, you know, having a healthy relationship with your feelings. I appreciate that. It was this slide that generated this question. And I yeah, wondered about great, great about series of questions. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for like one or two more, if there are any others. There is a question or a comment in the chat uh, from Nancy Lowry. Um, I don't know if she wanted to read it herself or I can read it. It's sort of a question, more of a comment too. Um, so she said, wow, all of my questions seem relevant after the last half of your talk. That was very educational and informative. Uh, good for this white woman. Thank you. You speak about the universe in a way that makes me ask, is it finite? So what we can see is finite in the sense that um, at some point um, it is so big and light is has a finite speed limit, right? So at some point it will take light so long to travel to us that it will never get to us. Um, but we think that the universe is infinite. We think that it's infinite, but there's actually a limit to how far into the universe we will eventually be able to see. And I don't spend a lot of time on this, and I'm, but I would like to really recommend another book that you should take out from the library or pick up from your local independent bookstore is Katie Mack's The End of Everything, because she thinks through various um, end of universe scenarios. And um, I'll just say like on, on a little like side note, Katie and I met as prospective graduate students in 2003. And then we ended up choosing different, she chose Princeton and I chose UC Santa Cruz. And so then we didn't see each other for several years. And then she and I ended up actually working on the same dark matter particle. And so it's actually been a real joy. Her book came out last year, mine came out this spring. It's been a real joy. Um, we became professors around the same time and had our books come out at the same time. And um, that's a really cool like generational thing to see. So I love recommending her book, even though of course I would like you to get mine too. <laughs> And then there was another question in the chat from Olivia. I don't know if she wanted to read it herself or if you wanted me to read it. It's up to you. You can unmute yourself if you'd like to read it yourself, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been so fantastic. Um, I, I think, I feel like my question was a little all over the place, but I just, one aspect I really appreciate about this talk was just the idea of, um, like I just think about the way I was taught evolution in school and it looked like the like capitalist propaganda like it's like and it's not you know like it matched so neatly with this very limited view of the world and I really appreciate that what you're I think one aspect that I was really resonating with me was just being open to the possibility of something not fitting into a paradigm you recognize or that we've been taught to to see the world as um you know i think like one of the challenges that we face when we're trying to teach any concept any complex concept is that i'm um, we work through analogies a lot i'm um, and which analogies we choose are going to be shaped by what our social and political milieu is and so um, you know, if you're in an environment where people really want to emphasize the importance of capitalism, then like um, capitalism can seem like a good analogy. And the, the book that I would like to point you to, and it's one that I use as a reference point, and I must cite at least like two or three times in my book, is Audra Wolf's Freedom's Laboratory, um, where she actually outlines using archival evidence. So this is not just like, you know, um, her ideas that she thought about. Um, she shows through the archive that the idea that science was value neutral and did not have a politics associated with it was actually propaganda that was developed by the CIA and the State Department as part of the Cold War. Um, and, you know, I'm saying this to you as someone who really believes in doing science. So I don't think like me sharing that means that I'm anti-science or anything like that. Um, but the way that um, children are taught about science is a highly political thing. Um, that has to do with what the people in power think the function of teaching science is. So even Audra talks about these textbooks that they made for Taiwan because they were trying to influence politics in Taiwan in a particular way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great book. I reviewed it for physics today. So if you want to read a review, you can look for my name and I'm Freedom's Laboratory and you'll find the Physics Today review.
We might have time for one more question. If anybody had one, they can put in the chat. Um, oh, no, yep. <laughs> there is a message from Jody Green. Uh, mm. Do you want me to read it or do you want to unmute yourself, Jody? I'm happy to read it. Um, thank you okay. so much. Such a beautiful talk, Chanda. And I have a lot of questions about the latter part of your talk, but I'll I'll actually ask you a geeky science question, um, which is just that I was really struck by the balloon analogy, um, where you showed that the galaxies don't expand, but space time expands. And I was just wondering why why don't galaxies expand when space time is expanding? Why are they resistant? Okay. I was having technical problems for a second, but I think I know I know what the question is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um sorry i hit the wrong button and like had terrible sound in my ear for a second you might have missed all the um complimentary things i said about your talk at the beginning so i just said what a Thank great you. talk and how many questions i have about the latter part and how we make more black physicists but this was my this was my geeky question for you is just why why don't the galaxies expand right so um, the thing that I'm going to say that's going to blow your mind a little bit and try not to freak out is that the universe is expanding because of gravity. Okay. Um, but gravity works differently on different when, when you're taking different scales into account. And so when I say like the universe is expanding because of gravity, really, there is no such thing as a gravitational force, right? There's just space time being curved. And so how that functions depends on the scale. So when the, when the universe is, when you're on very large scales, you have the space time that is carrying things apart because it's just expanding. At very small scales, you still have the local Newtonian-like attraction. So um, particles that are in what we would call like a gravitational well are still attracted to each other. Whether something forms a galaxy or not, there's actually an inflection point where there has to be enough stuff clumped together that the gravitational attraction resists the background expansion that's pulling it apart. This is actually a calculation that I learned how to do as a graduate student. But there's actually a point where you have enough matter that things start to clump together and are resistant to, to, to being pulled apart. And when I say gravity is causing it to expand, what I really mean is that like Einstein's equation describes the scenario where space time is expanding, but it doesn't preclude on smaller scales, these attractive behaviors from happening. So there's one other thing that I just wanted to say about that. So if we're using like this gravitational lensing image um, as, as an example, so you have this like curved space time. So when I say there isn't really gravity, right? What really happens is that stuff gets captured in a gravitational well um, because space time is curved around it. And so, like, you know, you think about it, it's harder to get out of a divot than to get off something that's flat. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really what I, I I'm I'm probably gonna cause some controversy um, <laughs> by giving it like a really quick answer like that. But the main thing is is that you know the galaxies in these images are held together. Even, um, you know, this is a galaxy cluster, so it's a cluster of lots of galaxies. They are strongly enough at, attracted to each other because there's enough matter there that um, the background expansion can't pull them apart. So it's a balance point. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I think if we don't have any more questions, I think we will. Say thank you so much. This was a wonderful talk and- Thank you all for coming and thanks for organizing this. This was, a, there's many thank yous and thank yous in the chat. And it was wonderful listening and learned a lot that I never <laughs> knew about. So this was very, very fun. Um, we do have a copy of your book here at the library that people can check out if they want to. It is on display right now. Um, it has a really cool cover and I, if somebody checks it out before me, that's fine. But <laughs> um, and then Olivia, did you have a question or because your hand is raised? Oh, is that on accident? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was just clapping some more. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I couldn't tell if it was a hand raise or a clap. Okay. But thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Shonda, for thank you. Thank you everyone for talk. coming and for all the great questions. It's so great to see so many women here too. So thank you. Have a nice night, everyone, and thank you. And
Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, everyone.